the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Hi, Justin. How you doing? I'm good. How's it going, Lindsay? I can tell you I'm super excited to be talking about a Pam Greer movie. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm glad that we're doing a Pam Greer movie. I'm also excited that we're finally doing a Tarantino movie. I know we did True Romance, but it's crazy to me that it's been four years here, and this is our first full-blown Quentin Tarantino writer-director episode. And we're talking about Jackie Brown here, and we'll get into it, but... Um, I guess I'd stay, I, I just want to say on the, at the top of the episode that normally, you know, if you've been listening to us before, we usually talk a little bit about the director's career. We're going to put that on hold for Tarantino, uh, simply because, um, in September we are going to do Reservoir Dogs, which I'm really excited to talk about. It's a 30 year anniversary of Reservoir Dogs. And that seems to make more sense logically to kind of talk about the early makings of Tarantino since that was his debut film. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about Tarantino in this episode, don't get me wrong, but like we're going to save some of the more informal career stuff, like pre-Pulp Fiction stuff for September. But I do find um, when people talk Tarantino, Jackie Brown is seldom comes up. It's an interesting movie in his career. I'm glad we're doing it because it is kind of underseen. It is a movie, though, that I did not like when it came out, and I was like a huge Tarantino fan. And I probably haven't seen this movie in about 10 years, and I've watched it several times in the last few weeks gearing up for this episode. And I can understand why. I'll talk about that later. I can understand why I didn't like it when it came out. This movie has grown on me so hard. I mean, this is probably one of my favorite Tarantino movies now. Yeah, since we've been doing this, um, Jackie Brown has just gotten stuck in my head. And it's kind of a mission now with me to to make sure people have seen this movie. And... There's a lot to talk about with this. Uh, first and foremost, we've got Pam Greer to talk about because mm-hmm. um, this movie borrows heavily from a whole era of films that she was in in the 70s. And, you know, we all know Tarantino is that guy now. He likes to pay homage to films that he loved that came out in the 70s. And he does that here, you know, even taking part of the name of, you know, movies that <laughs> Pam Greer was yeah. in and casting her in something that I don't know that another director would have been able to do that at this time period um, just simply because he was had the most amount of acclaim that a director could have. And how, I mean, I, honestly, like the most amount of claim someone could have pulp, post Pulp Fiction, where I think he could have really said out whatever he was wanting to do, they would say yes to. And the fact that he wanted to do something that was a relatively low budget movie with actors that they didn't have to pay a ton of money. I, I, I think any studio would have been like, yeah, we'll turn a profit on that just because the Tarantino is like, <laughs> on fire right now like and this movie there's a lot to talk about because one it's like him adapting another person's work it also is a movie that is showcasing two really great actors who um, were no longer really in their prime they had both not really been the main character in something in a while like they were big in the 70s and 80s and he kind of I don't I don't want to say like revitalized their career but gave them you know, took a shot on two actors that um, are really great in this film and I, yeah. I can't really see anybody else playing these roles, you know, other than Pam Greer and Robert Forster. And then also, too, like thematically, this movie hits me harder, I think, watching it uh, as as an older person because deals so much with like aging and, and being afraid to of like starting over like realistic, you know, internal struggles that I think is very are, are, are very universal. And this is a movie that is about working class people, too. It's easily his most adult movie. Yeah. So we'll get into talking about the writing, the adaptation of this story, Pam Greer's influence over the story and how Tarantino specifically wanted her to be involved with this project. The overall tone and themes, there's a lot of visual storytelling involved in this film. We always get into the reception and I'm sure with this movie, we're going to talk about some of our favorite scenes. Yeah, and the uh, the music. This is uh, oh the first gosh. movie. God, yes. First movie that we've done in a while that's giving uh, Dead Presidents run yes. for its money for a really cool <laughs> soundtrack. Yeah, Dead Presidents is still up there. It's still heavier, but Jackie Brown. There's just something that I feel. Oh, I just feel it in my soul. 
I feel almost like I'm going a little crazy because I'm I'm not gonna lie. Across 110th Street just plays <sighs> in my head constantly. Like it just on cycle lately. And I you know I tried to do one of those things where it's like maybe if I just play the song a ton that it'll help. <laughs> it's like no, nope. It's just that song gets it's catchy. It gets it gets way up in the brain. I have found myself at work singing it to myself, and like I don't even care if somebody hears it. Yeah. I I love that song. And the lyrics are so brutal. In that they song really too. So are. It's, like, it's <laughs> yeah. a weird song to be like stuck in your head all the time. Yeah, when you when you figure out what the lyrics are, you're yeah. like, "Damn, okay, yeah. this is this song's real." And the one thing I'm most excited about for this discussion is the cast. We we always have a good time talking about the cast, but this is one of those movies where I was watching it, and it, again, it had been a while, and you're just like, "Dang!" I mean, there's just one person after another. Like, I love every single one of these actors. Yeah, you know, especially like the main, the star actors that are kind of secondary in this movie. They're not the leads, like Michael Keaton or Robert De Niro, who. I'm excited to talk about his performance in this. Control. We'll definitely have to detour a little bit into talking about Pam Greer's uh, career here because she's such an influence on Jackie Brown. And for our picks of the week, we both went the Pam Greer route, which I, which wasn't planned at first. You know, we kind of it just sort of happened organically, which I was really happy about. I knew you were going to be doing a '70s Pam Greer movie, so I tried to find something that was like at least a little bit later era Pam Greer. And it got kind of tough there in some of the late eighties, early nineties, because she was doing more television work and not Mm -hmm. doing as many uh, starring roles. But um, I really liked the movie above the law. I hadn't seen it in forever. Uh, Steven Seagal's first movie and Pam Greer, probably when that movie came out in 1988 was like the most famous person in that movie. And I think she has like a really nice co-starring role in that. So I chose uh, above the law. That's what I'll be talking about later. I'm glad you did that one. It's been so long since I've seen it. And what was your 70s Pam Greer pick? Well, I went with the first movie that I ever saw her in, which was 1973's Coffee. And of course, Pam Greer is known as Foxy Brown, I think, the most to anybody. But to me, man, she is coffee. There is nothing like that movie. I watched it last night, and uh, it was on Tubi, which I was happy about. And right now, there's so many old Pam Greer movies on Tubi. It's if you want to go down a Pam Greer 70s rabbit hole like i suggest hopping on because uh, we say this all the time tubi's free I, I still like i know talking to people love <laughs> movies i'm like are you tubi are you watching they're like eh, i don't know i've heard of it i'm like i'm telling you man this is that there's so many good cult like wild weird stuff on there tubi needs to sponsor us they really do yeah as far as pam greer movies um i don't think all of them but a fair amount of the prison movies that she was in in the 70s i mean I I wanted to do one of them and I I couldn't bring myself to like um actually talk about um elements of the film like while I was laughing and completely entertained um there's some things that are you know not okay yeah. by today's standards but yeah. highly entertaining depending on uh um if you're easily offended or not The women in prison uh 70s <laughs> genre has not aged well for sure <laughs> Definitely not but Scream, Blackula Scream is on there. I okay. saw that as a kid. I completely forgot she was in it. That one's well worth revisiting, you, too. You did a deeper dive than me. I didn't get to Scream, Blackula Scream. Yeah, I, I really did. Yeah. Well, after Picks of the Week, we always round things out with our Murray moment, where Lindsay gives us a great research story on Bill Murray. I never know what she's going to say before we do this, so I'm always as surprised as you. And uh, before we get into our first clip from Jackie Brown, Lindsay, can you... Give me a quick summary, your interpretation of what this movie's about. It's kind of one of those movies that I feel like comes off more complicated than it actually is. There is a lot going on in this movie. Upon re-entering the States from across the border, a flight attendant named Jackie Brown is busted for smuggling money back to an illegal arms dealer named Ordell. She's caught in a really tough spot here because the feds want her to flip on Ordell. And if she doesn't, she's faced with prison time. If she does, she's faced with Ordell snuffing her out for good. She's a 44-year-old woman who's fought for what she has, and this choice could end everything for her. Jackie makes a decision, a very risky one, which no one sees coming. With confidence at her heels and the help of a bail bondsman who's very taken with everything about her, Jackie decides to double-cross Ordell and the authorities and make off with an even larger amount of cash. It's it's funny. I, I think of this as a heist movie, but then, you know, when I'm watching, I'm like, man, there's like... It's like 80, 90 minutes of just hanging out with these characters before really even like the idea of like a heist comes into play. Totally. Um, But that doesn't bother me at all. You know, to me, this movie isn't really about the heist. It's more of the relationship between the two leads. Yeah. The way the story unfolds is, is a beautiful thing to watch. 
I guess not a heist. It's more of like a double cross, really. Yeah. You know? It's, yeah. I get, it, it's in the heist Semantics, genre. Yeah. Well, let's go to a clip. We'll come back. We'll get into Jackie Brown. Sounds good. Is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? I think it's a gun pressed up against my dick. <laughs> well, you thought right. Now take your hands from around my throat, nigga. What the hell's wrong with you, Jackie? Shut the fuck up and don't you move. Oh, what is this? What the fuck is hey, this, Hey, huh? hey, hey, now that ain't got nothing to do with you. I carry that all the time. You've been talking to them police too much. Oh, the police didn't try and strangle my ass. Oh, come on, girl. You know I was just playing with oh, you. Oh, I ain't playing with you. I'm going to unload both of these motherfuckers if you don't do what I tell you to do. You understand what I'm saying? Jackie, stop acting crazy. Do you understand what the fuck I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, woman, damn. Now sit your ass down on that sofa. See? Police start fucking with your mind, start pitting black against black. That's how they do. You know, been doing it since the beginning. Shut your raggedy ass up and sit the fuck down. <sighs> and put your hands behind your head. Come on, this gets silly now. Oh, silly? You want to see some motherfucking silly? If I have to tell you to shut up one more time, I'm going to shut you up. I just came over here to talk to you. To talk? The way I see it, you and me got one motherfucking thing to talk about. One thing, and that's what you are willing to do for me. I can get your lawyer. Oh, no, L let's be realistic. Now, sooner or later, they're going to get around to offering me a plea deal, and you know that. That's why you came here to kill me. <laughs> I ain't come over here oh, to no, kill you. Okay. It's okay. Now, I forgive you. Now, let's say, if I tell on you, I walk. If I don't, I go to jail. Uh-huh. I want $100,000 in an escrow account in my name if I'm convicted up to a year or put on probation. Now, if I have to do more than a year, you pay another $100,000. I can do that. Now, we'll talk more about Tarantino's early career rise when we do Reservoir Dogs in September. But I want to paint a picture here of like a post Pulp Fiction Tarantino because I think a lot of that has to do with the expectations of what he was going to make and going into Jackie Brown. There's a three-year period between Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown. In Hollywood years, that's like may as well be a decade. When you have a hit on your hands, you want to have that next movie coming out quick. Tarantino had probably the biggest rise of a director that's ever been recorded and probably ever will be. In 1994, when Pulp Fiction came out, Quentin Tarantino was the first like rock star director his face was front and center like he was so famous from pulp fiction not not just the movie being big but it was like a hit soundtrack and he was just huge on the interview circuit clearly loved the movies could talk about movies all day so film fanatics could relate to him guest starred on tv shows he even there was a movie called destiny turns on the radio i was working at the theater when this movie came out and he's in the movie for like such a tiny portion of time. This movie came out in 1995. It's a terrible movie. But we got a standee, you know, this big standees that you put in the hallways of movie theaters. We got one of those and it was just a huge standee, like a six foot tall, life size Tarantino. <laughs> and he's like standing next to, you know, I think a car or something. And I mean, you would think that he's the main star of the movie, but that's how big he was just putting his face in front of something, his name in front of something like he produced a few things and like he could really make something blow up. This is like pre YouTube and the internet and like buzz. I mean, it, it, you couldn't get any bigger buzz than Tarantino. So the expectation of what he was going to do next was so huge. And then there was just this huge wait waiting period. Um, you know, he, acted in a few things. He directed an episode of ER. Uh, he wrote and starred in From Dust Till Dawn with George Clooney, which is a movie I really do actually uh, really think is great. And I think he does a good performance in yeah. that. But everybody was clamoring, like, what are you going to do next? What is this movie that you're going to do next? Like, was it going to be an original? And I think it was a kind of a wild move that he said, you know what, I'm going to adapt somebody else's work. You know, he was billed as like, this is the new original voice in cinema. And Tarantino got people who weren't really even film buffs excited about movies, excited about him as a director, because um, he was always talking about movies and in interviews. And kind of a bold move to, you know, you, you get all this acclaim as like a new original voice in cinema, especially during the big 90s independent boom. You're like the head of that to your next big, fo your follow-up to your greatest success is uh, an adapted work, not not an original work. 
And by this point, Tarantino is Miramax's golden boy. He and collaborator Lawrence Bender were gearing up to do Pulp Fiction, and Bender said that the story that would become Jackie Brown just kind of came to them. Tarantino had been a fan of Elmore Leonard's novels already, and the opportunity came around to option possibly one or more of Leonard's novels. So Tarantino and collaborator Roger Avery acquire the rights to Freaky Deaky, Kill Shot, and Rum Punch. Tarantino's not totally sure yet which one he wants to do, but goes back and rereads Rum Punch and convinces producer Lawrence Bender that this is the one that they have to do. Elmore Leonard novels have been adapted since the 60s. Uh, there was 310 to Yuma, The Big Bounce, Moonshine War, uh, Mr. Majestic with Charles Bronson, which Tarantino references in True Romance, The Ambassador, Burt Reynolds, Stick. Some of these I was familiar with. I mean, most of this stuff came out before I was born or when I was a kid. I don't know how well known Elmore Leonard was as far as like these being his adapted works. Like this is an Elmore Leonard movie adaptation. Yeah. I think with Get Shorty with John Travolta, like this is post Pulp Fiction 1995 crime movies were like huge now because because of Tarantino. And that's the first like time I heard like Elmore Leonard's name. And then, of course, after that we would come familiar with Jackie Brown and out of sight and that, you know, there's a slew of others that became more of a, this is an Elmore Leonard adaptation. Like his name was up in front in any reviews or like people talking about the movies. It is kind of crazy to go for so many decades and have so many novels that you're writing adapted into movies. That has to say something about, you know, you as a writer. Yeah. And he was, I mean, he was a pretty old guy whenever yeah. uh, Tarantino came yeah. around, uh, you know, is like way late in his career when uh, one of the biggest filmmakers on the planet's like, hey, I want to adapt one of your books into uh, my next big movie. So a year before production is set to begin, Tarantino starts the adaptation process of Rum Punch. And like we say, with pretty much every novel that we've talked about on this podcast that's been adapted into a screenplay, there's a fair amount that's been left out of the book. But Tarantino keeps the caper aspect of it and a lot of the idiosyncrasies of the individual characters. But there is a fair amount that he does change. Some significant changes, too. One, he moves the story from L.A. to West Palm Beach. He changes the title from Rum Punch to Jackie Brown, of course. The title character originally was Jackie Burke. Obviously, it's not Burke anymore. Originally, Jackie Burke was also, I believe, like 35 or in her early 30s. And Jackie Brown is a mid-40s woman. That's a significant change if you're, you know, maybe you haven't hit 35. Uh, but it is a significant change those 10 years. We also changed the title character from a white woman to a black woman. And another thing he changed, which I think is interesting, is that uh, the Lewis character that's portrayed by Robert De Niro in the movie in the book, he works for Max Cherry, the bail bondsman played by Robert Forrester, and Tarantino kind of like splits that. He doesn't make them associated with each other, which kind of makes more sense in Tarantino's version because I think it would be just like more complicated than it needs to be if like he's working for Max and then he gets involved with Wardell. I like it that their relationships are like completely clean, like they don't know each other in this movie. Yeah, it simplifies it, and it makes the one time that we see them interact or see each other uh, much more of a dramatic, pivotal yeah, moment yeah, in the movie, out. too. It sticks out more, yeah. too, yeah, in a good way because it's a plot point. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Going back to making Jackie Burke into Jackie Brown and making the central character a black woman, this was a pretty significant change and really awesome, actually, for Quentin Tarantino. He did set out to make this... Um, he saw this character as kind of an extension of Foxy Brown. He grew up watching black exploitation movies um, throughout his childhood. You might find it strange, maybe, that um, this little white nerdy kid in the 70s grew up watching black exploitation movies, but it was his experience. And he's gone on record many times saying how um, influenced he is by black culture. It definitely comes up in his films pr fairly regularly, but especially in Jackie Brown. And having a strong, cool, confident um, lead character that is a black woman in 97 that I mean it just didn't happen going back and watching a lot of these Jackie Brown era interviews with Tarantino they're pretty cringy you know he's like <laughs> yeah, kind of giving bit. himself like huge pats on the back yeah. for you know I wanted to make a black movie <laughs> and but you know I agree like in 1997 like you, you know it's it's sad that it, it took like the biggest white director in Hollywood yeah. who's like famous to, are we surprised though right I mean? to but there was definitely like a, a new era of black cinema with movies like Boys in the Hood, but there wasn't a lead. There wasn't a lot of movies where like the lead character was a, 
a black woman and a middle-aged black woman, you know, and someone like Pam Greer, who like had this history of black cinema behind her. I think the way that he came at making this movie was much more earnest than, say, um, how studios were looking at movies that had an all black cast. Like, honestly, during this time, they were looking at movies like this and being like, no, we've already got our black movie for this year. We don't need another one. And that's, I mean, awful to say, but that was the reality at the time. When I think, too, one thing that Tarantino does in the script that I don't know that was like a big part of the original script and that race becomes a part of the movie, you know, like Ordell's character is like aware of being a black man who's like into nefarious things, who has to work with a bail bondsman and he's got red tape that he has to walk around. And he explains that, you know, and he talks about uh, Jackie saying, you know, saying Jackie They've, they, if, if she was a white woman or she was a celebrity that was white, they would just give her uh, possession. But because she's a middle-aged black woman, they're charging her with intent and they're giving her a hard time. Obviously, that wasn't in the original book because yeah. the character was white. And I do like that Tarantino doesn't shy away from that because, again, in the 90s, even though there were movies that had lead black characters like a Denzel Washington. By the 90s, people were saying, you know, why can't, why does the Tom Cruise character, why does he have to be a white guy? Why can't he be a black guy? And some of that changed, but then in those movies, race never really was talked about. Um, it was just kind of put aside because it's like, oh, this is an action movie, but Tarantino doesn't do that. He doesn't put race aside. I'm going to make a movie that has two black central characters, but race will come up in the movie. And it is something that makes the movie more realistic. Any elements of race where that's brought up, it's, it doesn't feel like it's something that's inserted into the plot as a I'm trying to make a point type of thing. It's, it is very yeah. much like the real experience of these particular characters. It feels like it would come up naturally how yes. the characters are dealing with their situations. And, and race plays a factor in why Jackie's in the situation she's in, in Tarantino's version. And they don't, you know, that's not shied away from. I mean, again, it's the movie doesn't halt and dead in its tracks to make a message or something. But it's just it's part of that reality that she's living and why she needs to get out. Why, you know, why she's afraid to start over. It's hard to really think of another actress being able to pull off the character of Jackie Brown other than Pam Greer. I mean, at the time we have like... Big names like Whoopi Goldberg, Angela Bassett, Oprah to to some degree, Cicely Tyson, not necessarily a marquee name, but certainly respected and been around for ages. Um, and maybe, you know, Angela Bassett could have pulled off Jackie. She could have. She could have totally pulled off Jackie Brown. But Tarantino specifically wanted Pam Greer because of his lifelong love of black exploitation films. And Pam Greer is the uh, queen, really, if you're not familiar with this era of film in the 70s, she really was the uh, queen of this era of being a female action star, I would say. And Jackie Brown's not an action star by any means, but she shares a lot of the same qualities. It's almost like Jackie Brown is Foxy Brown grown up, and that is very much intended um, from Quentin Tarantino's writing standpoint. And just to briefly get into this era that Tarantino's pulling from, in early 70s, black audiences just weren't seeing themselves represented in movies. There was like Sidney Poitier, but there was just very few black actors as a main character in cinema houses. But Melvin Van Peebles got a studio picture deal and he wanted to make a movie that represented people that he, like himself on screen. So he wrote a script with a strong black lead who defies authority called Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. He pitched it to the studio and they didn't want to touch it. So he ended up financing the movie himself, totally independent. And it was a very, very low budget affair, like kind of a crudely made movie, but made with a lot of heart and uh, got the attention of the Black Panther Party. They considered it like required viewing and uh, black audiences responded to it. Once some of these movies made money, more money was being poured into like making movies throughout the 70s that had strong black characters enter Pam Greer into um, these early women in prison films, but then she becomes the central character in a lot of gritty crime laden movies. You know, I think uh, toward the end of the seventies, black exploitation started getting criticized for not really showing any positive traits with these characters. But again, um, like we said with Jackie Brown at the time period, 
you know, there really wasn't representation. So like, in you know, historically you see it as a, as a step up, even though like, you know, it's easy to retrospectively look back and criticize. And you see a pretty big dramatic change between coffee in 73 to like Friday Foster in 75, especially in how um, black characters are represented, like in Friday Foster or, in, you know, in coffee, she's like killing people and having sex with somebody to like get, assassinate them. She's got like, an angle. Yeah. She's got an angle. But then in Friday Foster, you know, she's a photographer. Yeah. She witnesses a crime. Yeah. It's, it's a very much, it's a very different movie. It's a higher budget. And you know why that era kind of died out was because the stories were played out or they were just recycling kind of like the same thematic elements and same types of characters. And audiences were kind of bored. They'd seen it already. What's kind of cool about Jackie Brown, while this is not a black exploitation movie whatsoever, just taking elements from that era, it's almost like it's the the next evolved step past that, where we don't have the pimp aspect, the prostitute aspect. We've got drugs, we've got money, we've got violence, but we're taking more of the positive aspects of like an ass kicking woman who is cool and confident and is the star and lead of this movie that really is in a male dominated genre. And you bring up a good point because in this movie, it's all about her world being dominated by males and she's playing them. One of the things I love about the script in this movie is that things aren't always like said like on the nose. Um, you know, we see that she's a flight attendant in the beginning of the movie. Then we don't see Pam Greer's character for like 25, 30 minutes. Yeah. We get enough information. And when she gets apprehended by the ATF, they say that, you know, she's been working as a stewardess for X amount of years. Through the whole movie, I think it's implied that she's been working in the service industry all these years. She knows how to talk to people. She knows how to change the way she's talking and how to talk to people in the way that makes them comfortable and makes them feel like she's doing them a service. Yep. And we see it throughout the whole movie. You know, the way she talks to Max is very different. You know, it's very calming. She's like inviting him in and she's like, you know, being very sweet when she talks to Ordell. It's a little more cold. It's a little more matter of fact. It's a little more direct when she talks to the ATF, the Michael Keaton character, you know, she's sort of in between. She's guarded, but she makes him think that, no, I really want to help you and really pumps his ego up. She's really good at massaging the male ego to like manipulate a situation to get what she needs. And it's done in a way that like you, you love Pam Greer's character. You know, you're, yeah. you're rooting for her the entire time. Like you want her to get out of the situation alive and with the money. And I think the reason why we're rooting for Jackie so much is Tarantino does a great job of showing all these male characters in her world, trying to put her in a box like Michael Keaton's partner when he's being pretty rough with Jackie and he's saying, you know, you didn't light the world on fire. You know, I think it hits the audience hard because that's a relatable thing of someone like, you know, just kind of like reducing your existence to like one moment or one decision and so we want Jackie to be able to get out of this. And as she starts to work her way through these characters and be able to change, you know, flip it around and like be able to manipulate these characters into following her lead, following her plan. And then also, too, it makes us love Max Cherry a little bit more because I think the heart of the movie is her relationship with Max. And no, it's not the sexual relationship. You know, there's something there. There's like a caring. He's valuable to her because he knows the ropes and he knows um, what the cops may and may not do. He's been working as a bail bondsman all these years. He knows like the laws and how things are going to go down. He talks to her with respect and she doesn't have to fight for his respect, even from the very get go. You know, when he talks to her at the bar, he's very, you know, as soon as she says, I don't want to go to a cop bar, he's like, oh, OK. You know, he doesn't start arguing with her and like, well, why don't we just go here? It's a very refreshing begin to a male female relationship in a movie. With all of these male characters telling Jackie what she is to them, Max is the only one that does something that is uh, just this one small thing that indicates how he perceives Jackie and what Jackie is to him. There's a scene in which she puts on the band the Delphonics and Max sees that it means a lot to her and he enjoys it too. And then he goes out and he buys a Delphonics tape. That is an example of a male character wanting to get to know someone, not telling this woman what she is to them or what he can get from her. He wants to know her. 
And it's just something that's so um, small and pure and tells you everything about the friendship, the relationship that's about to form between these two. And I know at the top of the episode, I talked about how I didn't like this movie the first time I saw it. And I was probably 19 or 20 when Jackie Brown came out. Loved Pulp Fiction. That was like my favorite movie when I was going into Jackie Brown. Yeah. And this relationship that her and Max have, this theme of like aging and starting over, that was just kind of foreign to me. You know, like when they have a five minute conversation about getting older and she's saying it's different for women than it is for men. And there's all these things going on in this scene of, you know, Max not picking up on how different it is for him. He's like, ah, you know, I was worried about my hair, but, you know, she's talking about how like society perceives women and how, especially as a black woman, you know, having to present herself in a certain way. And these were all lost on me as a 20 year old. So I was like, man, this movie is so boring. It's like, why are they talking (laughs) about all this stuff? And then like, when I watch it now, these scenes, you know, they're very emotional. And the things that Jackie Brown are talking about are identifiable. It's like watching this as an older person. And you do have a fear of like starting over a new job or like starting your life over, whether it be like a post of divorce or um, moving to a new town. It's different when you're younger, you can bounce back quicker. But as, as you get older, you know, your life gets more structured and you start to cling to things that are more familiar and comfortable. I think that's a theme throughout this movie. And that's the drive. That's the push that Jackie Brown's going through. And the idea that, you know, she even says herself, like, starting over is way more scarier than Ordell ever is, you know, him coming after her to kill her. Pretty mature themes for Tarantino, I think. And having this crime drama backdrop set to these two characters who are having an adult, platonic, mature relationship and talking about their feelings about life and what they're going to do. And, you know, Max is talking about, get, you know, he makes this decision, like, I'm going to change my life. Like, she influences him. She's trying to change her life. And then immediately he sa- he decides, you know what, I need to make a change in my life. I need to get out of the bail bondsman business. I feel like the movie would be at a loss if it was more focused on the crime aspect of the movie and not these themes of, like, aging in society. Going along with the idea of starting over and aging and feeling like you have the weight of the world on you, you have to make a decision. This idea of having a second chance, that if Jackie loses her job, she goes to jail, she's got nothing. She doesn't have anything to start over with. And this is a huge gamble that these two basically strangers have partnered into And luckily, it it worked out for both of them. And I think that that's why the ending is so satisfying. We don't know exactly where Jackie's going to end up. And we don't know what Max is going to do with his bail bonds business. Is he going to get out of the business? Is he going to continue to stay in it? But what we do know is that they both helped give each other a hard reset where they do have a second chance to take another avenue in life. And it's so satisfying to end the movie in this way because the scene ends with, Jackie saying to Max, what would you do if you had the chance to get away with this amount of money? And we, at the end of the movie, we have that question answered for us. Yeah, I also feel like there's another question that's answered. And Tarantino does this with a multitude of his movies where a scene is set up and you will start to question a character's motives. He'll give you a logical answer, whereas like other movies are watching, you're like, hey, wait a minute, you know. And the question I have in my mind when I'm when I first started watching Jackie Brown is why would she risk all of this? You mm-hmm. know, the stakes yeah. are super high. And while you're starting to think about it, Max asks the logical question that an audience is going to ask is like, what what if he sees that the fifty thousand dollars is, you know, only on top and the money is not on the bottom? And she answers flat out, well, at least uh, I tried and I didn't go yeah. to jail. And that's about as good of answer, you know, yeah. as any any audience could have. And I always love that scene because in in any of these type of situations where you're clinging to a character and you're hoping that, you know, something bad doesn't happen to him, you want there to be some sort of like logic that you would have as the character. And also, I love this ending because we don't we don't see this epilogue of what her life is like. What did she do with the money? Where did she go exactly? Like, is she going on some adventure? But we just know from the look on her face when she's driving and it holds on her for a while that like. At this exact moment, she's in full realization that this is the beginning of this new chapter of her life. At least I personally feel like closure with Max that he's like, you know, I can't go with you. You know, this is your this is your journey. I'm glad that I was able to be a part of it or help you along the way. But like this is from here on out like this is you're an independent person and you need to like start this new journey without anybody else that's been in this movie in this world a part of attached to it 
there's a heaviness too at, yeah. at the end because she's not she's not driving in her car leaving Max like with a beaming smile on her face. It's like very much like I got to be smart about this and it's almost like a settling of what she's just been through, what she's come out of and Max has the same reaction when Jackie leaves his office and he takes a phone call. He's like I'm going to need to call you back in a couple minutes and has to take a couple moments to collect himself. And I think he just goes over and just like stares at a window or just like stares at a wall. Like you don't know. They've both been through something very intense together and are just separated to go on with their lives. Yeah. That scene you're talking about with each viewing of this movie, I love that scene more and more Mm -hmm. because we normally would get a movie where he chases after her. And I love that he needs to like, just get his composure together. You know, he's like, I'm still operating my business, but like, wow. I mean, it just like, it's hitting him that like, she's not coming back. He may never see her again, Yeah, but he's was just got pretty deeply involved in her life, you know, and like helped with this like huge, you know, crime. Yeah. And I love that that scene holds and there's so many scenes in this movie that hold like that, you know, like the pacing of this movie is deliberately slow. I think that's a big part of Tarantino's style. We take the time in this movie to get to know all these characters intimately, even all the way down to like Michael Keaton. I think in like a, do we need the scene where him and Jackie Brown are at dinner? Probably not. It's not super essential, but we're seeing that he's warming up to her more. We're seeing that um, she's working her magic on him a little bit. And then you know, the following scene where he feels pretty good about himself. Like you even see a change in Michael Keaton's character. Like he feels a little bit cockier. He feels like, Hey, I'm going to get what I want at the end of the, I mean, she's convinced him that he's going to get what he wants. I love the pace of this movie. I love that it takes its time. I mean, Tarantino has said in interviews that this is a typical hangout movie where you're getting to know these characters and there's not a lot of action, but if you're invested in the characters, um, you're going to care about what they're talking about and it's going to mean something. The other thing that Tarantino did with this movie that I think is a little bit different than his other movies, and I think it goes along with the pacing, is that the fact that he uses less violence in this movie than his other movies, part of me thinks that it's he got so much flack over Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, just the idea of like not having someone like bombard him with like questions about like why are you putting so much violence in your movies? Yeah. But I think because he's taking the time to hang out with these characters and making you care about them sometimes a moment of shocking violence can kind of like throw you off. It changes the tone of the movie. And I think what what Tarantino did with this, even though Ordell's killing people, we're not seeing like blood. We're not, it's not like Pulp Fiction where some guy's getting his head like exploded into the window and it goes blood red. And they've got like, they're talking about having like brains and bits of skull on the car seat. Like this is a movie that's, there is like violence, but it's not, it's, it's a bloodless violence. Um, I think you mentioned it off mic, a muted violence. Like we, see De Niro get shot by Wardell in the car and there is like a blood spatter but it's not it's not gross it's not up close we, yeah we know what happens but yeah. that, that's all we need for that now while this movie isn't known for its extreme violence one thing it is known for is how it's deliberately paced some would say slow when it came out it was a stark contrast to Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs And to say a movie is slow, that could sound negative. But Jackie Brown is a hangout movie. And that's why the more thrilling, tension-filled moments are so jarring and are a stark contrast once they do happen. One of my favorite examples of this is when Ordell goes over to Jackie's apartment right after she's been released from jail and he's planning on killing her. We see him walking up, putting on his murder gloves. He's going up there with one thing in mind. What happens in her apartment is this unspoken power play. Jackie walks out of the room. Ordell turns the lights down. Jackie comes back into the room. She turns the lights on. She walks out. He turns the lights back down. Jackie knows Ordell is planning to kill her, but Ordell's just kind of playing it like he always does, that he's the master of the situation and in control, not really thinking that Jackie's a woman that's going to have a gun on her and unafraid to confront him. So when they're both in a completely dark room because Ordell's turned off the lights and Jackie pulls a gun on him, Ordell's completely shocked. And this is the moment where all this tension buildup that we've been witness to is broken with humor by Ordell's reaction and Jackie completely flipping the tables on him and having him at gunpoint when the entire time Ordell thought that he was the guy in charge. And this is a very classic Tarantino move to have this lengthy, tension-filled buildup to the ultimate break, which is by use of humor. Yeah, I think in multiple movies pre- Jackie Brown, especially in like 
true romance, mm-hmm. you know, a scene where it's so tense, like Christian Slater is going to kill Bronson Pinchot. And then at the end, there's like, it's funny. And you hear Tom Sizemore like cracking jokes. He's like, I love this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Tarantino just really is great at, yeah, like you said, building these tension scenes, but then giving us a release of humor, which I find exhilarating when I'm watching movies. You know, I love get, get you know my heart rate going up and down. I mean, that's why I love horror movies so much. But yeah. I think he's really good at playing with an audience, but keeping you engaged in the story. It never feels um, forced. No, it doesn't. And certainly in this particular scene, we really learn what Jackie's about. We've seen a little bit on how she can play different people in in different situations. But here we know that Jackie knows exactly where she needs to go and she is in charge. And that's that's why this movie's called Jackie Brown. I think most of these scenes of tension involve Ordell. And because Jackie's been such a cool player and in control through the whole movie, and I think that's why... Tarantino doesn't have Jackie in the script meet Ordell at his house. Instead, she sends Robert Forrester. And the first inclination of that is an audience. You're like, what are you doing, yeah, man? You're yeah. insane. You're going to go to Ordell's house? You know, after all this, after he knows that Jackie's yeah. double-crossed him, and why would he do this? And then Robert Forrester starts explaining everything in a very logical way. Yeah. And Ordell's <laughs> listening, and they have, like, a mature conversation about it. Ordell's not convinced totally, but he's like, I'll go with you. But then when they get into the car, you know, we have this moment of humor again where, you know, you hear the uh, Didn't I Blow Your Mind This Time song come on. But then as soon as they get to Max's work where supposedly Jackie's in there waiting for him, we ramp up the tension again with, you know, if we go in there and anything happens, I'm going to shoot you first. That's all there is to it. Like, I'm not messing around. And we believe that to be true. You know, this is Ordell's time, you know, proven to be a ruthless person when he has to be. That whole scene preceding Ordell saying, you know, I'm going to kill you if this goes wrong. It's just silence of he and Max in the car. And you see how ice cold Ordell is in that silence with the Delphonic song on. And even that, as the viewer, you're like, you know that there's a definite chance that this is all going to go wrong. In addition to that, Tarantino also takes humor to throw us off and then add a very tense scene following that or a, a tense moment, a burst of violence. Um, in many of his movies, he does this, but in this one, whenever... Oh, Lord, are you going to talk about Lewis and Melanie? Yeah, yeah. When, oh, you know, and, and it's kind of, you know, we're into it. Melanie's like mocking Lewis and she's like, Lewis, where'd you park the car? And he's kind of looking around. You see that he's getting confused and she's just pushing his buttons. And we're we're thinking it's pretty funny. You know, she's been known to like sass all the characters in this movie. We're along, you know, we're along for the ride. You're kind of laughing at it. But then when Lewis like, murders her i mean he gives her a warning he says i need you to shut your mouth but but it's and it's kind of shocking you know and so that's it it throws us off and yeah in a lot of tarantino's movies whether there be humor or violence i always feel a little bit unsettled and even when i've seen the movie multiple times and most of his movies i have seen multiple times uh especially this one i still there's a moment where i'm like oh man i forget you know you almost forget because you get so into the movie and you get into the characters you know, it's easy to forget like, oh, yeah, this is where he's going to like kill her. Right yeah. After this, like pretty humorous scene. Yeah. And even after that, when he has to explain to Ordell, Ordell's like, where's Melanie? Yeah. Well, uh, I think she's kind of dead. Yeah. And it's what do you at- mean she's kind of yeah. dead. Well, and also and, and, and this is like this with uh, uh, multiple movies of Tarantino's where on a second rewatch, you know, like when you're watching Reservoir Dogs, it's like, yeah, all the guys at this table, like having a good time are going to all die later on in the movie. Yeah. And when you see Lewis, Melanie and Ordell all hanging out, you know, in their apartments, like, yeah, all these guys are dead by the end of the movie, but everything's so fun and friendly right now. And like you look at the latter half of the yeah. movie with the beginning and you think of, wow, what a stark contrast yeah. that is. And even though this was only... Tarantino's third movie as a writer director and he'd only written a few movies outside of not directing he'd already developed sort of this distinct style in the way he would frame shots and the way he would let the camera hang shots from in the trunk also having stories not be totally linear like Reservoir Dogs is out of sequence not not everything happens ABC same thing with Pulp Fiction we have the same characters but different moments in time and Jackie Brown is a little more straightforward but we do have the 
moment where he shows three different viewpoints of one specific incident that plays out, but something that is different than we are used to in movies as an audience. And we're like, oh, this is some, this is what he does. This is his style. Some of these styles and the way he does things for purpose, for reason. And putting the camera in a trunk is bringing us closer into the world of these characters, you know. They're going into their trunk, and he's doing that for a reason. He hangs on it. He lets them have a conversation. It's a sign of a strong director that you know, three movies in, he already has developed a style of like, here's how I want to do things. Here's how I want to tell the story. Here's where I want to put the camera in a purposeful way. Tarantino's visual storytelling in the scene you were just talking about with Jackie trying to pull off the heist and then that same event being told from three different points of view. Why it's so strong is Tarantino's initial setup. Jackie comes out and she looks frazzled and it's a completely chaotic situation. And Tarantino makes the extremely bold move to make the camera just circle her and create this sense of chaos. And Jackie looks like everything has just gone wrong. And we don't know exactly what has gone wrong. We're guessing right along with her. And it's not until the end of that scene when that tension again is broken and then that same event is told from two other points of view. It's just a great example of Tarantino utilizing his visuals to help create the narrative of the story. Jackie is confused and we're seeing that visually and we're feeling that. But it's all part of the setup to tell exactly what happened in this heist moment. No, I totally agree. It's a perfect example showing why Tarantino is doing things for a reason Uh, because we are confused. The camera's spinning around. And anytime you do that, I've seen other movies do it. And it's just like, it's kind of like nauseating because the camera's whipping around a character, even though you can focus on their face. It's like this inertia going on. And we're like, what the hell? Why is he doing this? Why is he spinning the camera? But then there's a reason for it. It's because Jackie's faking us out. She's faking yeah. out the <laughs> ATF, making them think that she's all scared and frazzled. And then you realize it's all an act. And, and you're Tarantino's like, oh. faking us out. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I don't want to pick on directors that came up with Aaron Tarantino, but Kevin Smith and Edward Burns are two filmmakers. I, I, I really like some of their writing in their early movies. Uh, Edward Burns especially. I love his first three movies. But to me, those guys aren't strong directors like Tarantino is in uh, specifically uh, Edward Burns' third movie, No Looking Back. There's a scene where Edward Burns is in it. He's the star and he's having a confrontation with his ex-girlfriend. They're having an argument in the park. The camera starts spinning around them just like it does in Jackie Brown. The argument really isn't all that intense. There really isn't a reason why the camera needs to be spinning around. He does it in a way that it just becomes distracting. And then when it's over, you're like, why? There just wasn't any reason to do it, but the reason why he did it is because he's seen it done in other movies. It doesn't serve a purpose. It's just like, we're just going to disorient the audience so that... And, yeah. and then you get dis- disoriented in in Tarantino's Jackie Brown. Jackie isn't saying any words. Yep. You're just visually seeing her all scared and everything, and you can focus on Jackie. In the Edward Burns movie, they're having a full-on argument conversation, but I'm not hearing what they're saying because the camera's whooping around. Yep. I'm like, what's happening right now? And by the time the camera stops, I'm like, I don't even know what they're arguing about. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and Tarantino, it's understanding and having a purpose of doing, placing the camera, letting it linger. He does things purposefully, even if he's riffing on an old movie, but he does things in a purposeful way that work for the story that he's trying to tell, for the scene that he's trying to tell. It always feels like he's totally in control and he's able to manipulate the audience without having things seem forced or unintentional. Even if he's riffing on something, he makes a scene his own. In Jackie Brown, I think the most standout scene in this movie is our first introduction to Ordell being this cold-blooded killer. You know, after he gets Beaumont in the car, you know, he pulls up, the camera's holding on Ordell. We see him turn on this music. He puts on his gloves. The camera's holding him. I mean, this is a long scene. Yeah. We see Ordell's car drive down the street. The camera's slowly pulling up. It's Samuel Jackson still driving. He, <laughs> he turns into an alley. Camera's going up. He We're pulls like in. Yeah. 200 yards away. Yeah, he pulls into this lot, and then the camera comes down just a little bit. And we're so far away. Now the car is totally small. Music's still playing, but faintly. We see Samuel Jackson get out, opens the trunk. We hear Beaumont's voice for just a second. We just see like a flash of gunfire. And then... You see Samuel Jackson slowly, you know, not make, you know, again, not rushing the scene. 
It's a very long scene that was all done in one shot. It becomes voyeuristic. We're allowed to see something that no one else is getting to see Ordell do. They know that he kills people, but they've never, this is his method, you know, with the gloves and everything, which is why later on when he does it again, it shows how menacing this character is. I think it's a good time. We'll take a break. I want to come back. Ordell is one of my favorite characters and most of Tarantino's filmography. We'll go to a clip. We'll come back. We'll talk about the characters and cast of Jackie Brown. And what about you, Max? What? If I was in the Colette's place? No, I mean you right now. Not if you were somebody else. If I saw an opportunity to walk away with a shopping bag full of money, would I take it? Well, you know where it came from. It's not like it's somebody's life savings. It wouldn't even be missed. Half a million dollars will always be missed. You're avoiding the question, Max. Okay, sure, I guess I'd be tempted. Especially now since I'm getting out of the bail bond business. Why? A lot of reasons. I guess the main one would be, uh, I'm tired of it. When did you decide? It's been a long time coming, but uh, I finally made up my mind. I guess it was Thursday. Mr. Brown? Yes? I'm Max Chair, your bail bondsman. The night you got me out of jail? Yeah. I went to pick up this guy. I hear he's staying at a house, and uh, I sneak in, and I'm waiting for him. Oh, wait a minute. After we were together, you snuck into a guy's house? Yeah. Went back to my office and found out that you took my gun, got another gun and the stun gun, went to this guy's house in El Monte and waited for him to come home. What do you do when he comes home? Shoot him with the stun gun. While he's incapacitated, uh, you cuff him and take him to county. You do that? That's my job. Did you do that that night? Well, the guy never came home. But I'm sitting on his couch, in the dark, holding my stun gun. The whole house smells of cat pee. And after a couple of hours, I think, what am I doing this? It's 19 years of this shit? And I make up my mind. That's it. I'm not sure you answered my question, Max. Which one? If you had the chance, unemployed now, to walk away with a half million dollars, would you take it? Now, getting back to Samuel Jackson's Ordell, this is definitely my favorite Samuel Jackson performance. Time and time again, it seems like Jackson is the actor who knows how to really speak Tarantino's language. His character here is, he's menacing, he's funny, he's charismatic. You can't take your eyes off of him when he's on the screen. You want to hear what he has to say. You know, he is a villain of this movie, but the perfect villain because it's a character that you love, that you're kind of rooting for, and you do feel kind of bummed out that even though he's double-crossed people and he's a ruthless killer, you feel kind of bad that he gets killed at the end of this movie and also had been working on this dream, you know, I'm going to save up, I'm going to retire, that, you know, he had this whole thing and it kind of all blew up in his face. But for the most part, I think a good villain is one that you want to watch that is charismatic. A lot of times in movies, a villain is so spiteful that you just, you don't care about them. You're like, oh, I'm so happy when they die and they're a chore to watch on screen. And that just isn't the case with most of Tarantino's villains and especially here. It's always really special when the villain of a movie is someone that you can feel bad for in some ways, even though obviously you wouldn't pick him over Jackie Brown to come out on top in this. But I love that you brought up his retirement plan. In the beginning of this movie, you're like, oh, look at this guy. It's not like he's not a bad guy. He doesn't want to stay in this guns deal forever. He's just looking to make a bunch of cash and then get the heck out of Dodge. His charm and humor uh, quickly dissipate when we see what an ice cold killer he can be. And and the more that I think about it, this might be one of my favorite performances of his too. This movie's just grown on me in general, but he is really an aspect that's captivating in every scene. That goatee though, that is really something special. I haven't seen that on a character before. Uh, it's like this braided, very, very narrow tiny goatee i mean is it a goatee it's not even it's just yeah, like it's like a goatee yeah it's just like a little five inch long braided thing 
from the bottom of his chin and his hair and a ponytail. Everything was Samuel L. Jackson's idea, too. And I think it's a great idea because for some reason, when he takes his hair down at the end of the movie, when you see it's not in the ponytail, he there's one particular shot where he just looks so menacing right before him and Max get into Max's car to go over to meet Jackie toward the end of the film. The tonal shift in his character at the end, you kind of forget that you liked him in the beginning. For me, up until the moment where he dies and Tarantino goes close in on his face, his eyes wide open, this was a complete shock. Not at all what Ordell thought was going to happen in his life. There, I feel bad for him, but the build up to that, though, he's terrifying. This role kind of harkens back to Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. This character who's kind of funny, charismatic, but you can't really trust him all the way because he is kind of a loose cannon. He's kind of crazy. He'll kill somebody to save himself in a heartbeat, not even think about it. And I love the way his relationship is with Robert De Niro's Lewis <laughs> because he respects Lewis, but he also kind of talks down to him at times. You know, he's bringing him in, he's trying to help him out. Lewis has been in prison for a while. Since you brought up De Niro's character of Lewis, it's a good time to talk about him. What a rare occurrence that Robert De Niro plays a supporting character and one that doesn't have that much dialogue either. He's all body language, this guy. Lewis has just gotten out of prison, I think, four days before when we first see him. He's reacclimating to life and just absorbing Ordell's atmosphere and getting used to being a person again. You told me once, Justin, that you wish that there was a scene where we see Ordell and Lewis go out shopping because they do come back into a scene where Ordell's bought Lewis some new clothes and it's like, yeah, you kind of got that goodwill look going on. We needed to we needed to spice you up a little bit. And part of me thinks that Tarantino must have thought of that same thing because what a cute idea for these guys who have been longtime friends. And the way that the character of Lewis is unveiled in this movie sneaks up on you. You're not quite sure that he's got the streak of violence that we see abruptly come out of him when he kills Melanie towards the end. He kind of seems quiet. You like him. I kind of like him. I want to hang out with him and smoke a bowl with he and Melanie. But the laid back nature and quiet air that De Niro had playing this role was kind of confusing to Samuel L. Jackson. He's talked about this a couple of times that he was, one, excited to work with a legend like De Niro, but thought that he was so withdrawn and quiet and questioned if he was paying attention at all in the scene. And it wasn't until he saw the film put together that he realized what a layered, intricate performance De Niro was actually doing. He might seem quiet. He might seem not completely all there, but that's very intentional. And he's just incredibly dialed in to the character of Lewis. Yeah, the very first time I saw this movie in theaters, I completely missed De Niro's performance in this. I didn't understand it. I was I was like, De Niro's in this movie and he doesn't even do anything. <laughs> and watching it now, it is this very understated performance of a guy, like you said, who is reacclimating to society. He's trying to fit in and he doesn't really know what he wants to do. He just knows that he wants to work with Ordell. And I love this interaction where Ordell calls Robert De Niro and Robert De Niro is staying with Simone and she's doing her dance for him. <laughs> and they have this like quick little phone call where Ordell says, oh, did she do this number? And he goes, I don't know the song names or whatever, but, you know, it's really good. And it's just this very, yeah. um, not bumbling performance, but he's like a character who's not, he's just kind of like there. He's like hanging out. And then when Samuel Jackson shows Robert De Niro Beaumont's body in the car, he's like, this is what, you know, that's what I do. The people who try to sell me out. And he's like, you know, are you in this for real? And Robert De Niro's kind of like looking off and he's like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Samuel Jackson's like, are you listening to me? You know, he's constantly confused because it's, and I don't know if uh, De Niro's character is supposed to be stoned the whole time, but I think a lot of it is just this, he's just had a very simple life. He's not had to have too many responsibilities. He's had someone telling him what to do in prison. He does such a good job of this like sort of stone character when Samuel Jackson's like, Lewis, are you, are you listening to me? And he's like, huh, what? He's like on the phone. He's like trying to get it, trying to get trying the to phone to work. Phone. Yeah, trying to dial the phone number. <laughs> And so many funny little comedic moments here. I think I just were kind of, I just were lost. I mean, the first time I saw this and it's, it is such a really nice little layered performance that we don't often see from De Niro because usually he's laying it on pretty thick. You know, he plays like a very intense character, sort of like shouting and normally don't see him like sort of stoned, quiet on the couch and someone telling them what to do. 
And it also doesn't take too much for his character to flip, but we spend so much time of the movie before we get to the heist scene, which is when he flips on a dime and turns into kind of a rage machine. Otherwise, the only thing we really understand about him is his allegiance to Ordell. Even when Melanie kind of brings up, we could team up and take all this money from Ordell. And soon after this, Lewis straight up tells Ordell this. So that's really the only thing that we understand about Lewis as a baseline. I think it's time we get to the heart of this film. Miss Jackie Brown, played by Pam Greer. Tarantino had always had a fascination with her and really wanted her to shine in this film. She was just an all-time favorite of his. And she had even auditioned for Pulp Fiction. The part went to Rosanna Arquette because uh, Tarantino couldn't see that character taking the abuse from someone as squirmy as Eric Stoltz in Pulp Fiction. So with her in mind from that audition, Tarantino calls up Pam Greer and says, I've got a story for you. Greer's like, I'll believe it when I see it. Like a year or something rolls by and he reminds her that there's still something that he's working on for her. Two years later, after Tarantino's invested so much time into this story, he calls her up and eventually gets the script to her. Pam Greer reads this and doesn't believe that she's the one that's expected to play Jackie Brown. She keeps thinking that there's another role in here that he's thinking about for her. She's just overwhelmed by the idea that he wrote this entire movie for her. I mean, Jackie Brown is meant for someone to shine in this role. This movie is all on this character and your love for her. So she read the script and didn't call Tarantino back right away, but she was excited at the idea that maybe she could play this role. And it was her partner at the time that said, I think you really need to get on this because, I mean, he's a hot director and he wants you for the lead role. She calls him and they talk about it and she says, I you know, kind of can't believe that you want me to play this role. And both Tarantino and Greer have said this, that he said to her, you are Jackie Brown. I mean, how do you turn down a role like that? And like you said, that assurance from Tarantino that she is Jackie Brown is what she said gave her a lot of the confidence that she needed. Because in the 70s, they, these were Pam Greer movies. And then in the 80s and 90s, she kind of bounced between studio films and smaller roles, parts on television. It didn't maintain like a huge high profile, but was still getting a lot of work. But I can certainly understand her being nervous because this movie is on her shoulders. And it'd been a while since she had the starring role. And then also, too, on top of it, knowing that this movie is coming off the heels of Pulp Fiction. This is going to be on thousands of screens. And a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with who Pam Greer is. And I'm guilty of that myself. I was young when this movie came out. I wasn't familiar with Pam Greer's 70s cinema. She was a new face to me, but it didn't matter because her performance in this movie is so captivating. You know, I think of a time when this movie came out, I was so jazzed about oh, Robert De Niro's working with Tarantino. You know, I love Michael Keaton. I was so ready to see another Samuel Jackson movie after Pulp Fiction. But Pam Greer, I was like, who is this person? Who's Robert Forster? Who are these people in this movie? And when I watch these performances now, again, it's so different to me watching it with older eyes because Pam Greer's performance, such a layered performance. She's playing so many different roles here as she's working her way through these three men that she has to manipulate in the way. And as she acts differently around each one, we see different sides of Jackie Brown's character. And it's a really involved performance. And I feel like she's someone that can turn the tables on Ordell. I also feel like she's somebody that can play it cool when she's getting grilled by the police. And I also see her as a character who can be really, really sweet and caring and take the time to let herself be vulnerable for Max Cherry's Robert Forrester. And I think the success of this movie is Pam Greer's performance mixed with Tarantino's confidence that she can pull this movie off. And he combines all the things that he loved about 70s era Pam Greer, making a wholly original character that totally fits in the 90s with a mature homage to Foxy Brown. He keeps her a mystery to us all, including also to her confidant and partner in crime, Max Cherry, played by Robert Forrester. His calmness and powerful performance in this is a nice counterbalance to Jackie's uncertainty. He's the grounding element that she needs to pull off her plan. I mean, without Max, I don't think that there's someone else in this story that we see anyway that could help Jackie out of this jam. 
Yeah, Robert Forster's performance in this, of all the things in this movie, watching this movie almost 25 years after it was made, sticks out the most to me. I know I keep reference to the first time I saw this, but I, it just reminds me of like, I didn't know who this guy is the same way with Pam Greer. It, he was just like a face to me. It's like, who is this guy? Why is he talking so quiet? And mm -hmm. he just seems so sad. And I don't know what I was thinking back then because his performance in this is <laughs> absolutely wonderful. I can't really even think of another actor who has this style of acting where he seems so gentle. He doesn't look quite like a movie star, but he has like this handsome older gentleman vibe about him. He seems tough and understanding. Like you said, counterpart, the perfect counterpart to Pam Greer in this. To me, this is the closest Tarantino's come to doing a realistic romantic portrayal of two characters. And I really do feel their chemistry in this is like what holds this entire film together. I mean, certainly there's this whole element of double crosses and murder, but there's this romantic element of them and will they get together? They have to trust each other in this. It's what to me makes the movie sincere and really heartbreaking at the end. I mean, I really love these two characters together. I want them to get together and you totally have to buy into the fact that she can trust Max Cherry and that Max Cherry can trust her because once they get into this together, he I mean, he could lose his entire life, his entire job. He's putting a lot on the line for her and she's putting a lot on the line for him because he works directly with the police. You know, I really buy this relationship. It's a really fascinating relationship to me and his character really fascinates me. You know, I'd watch a television series on Max Cherry, the bail bondsman, and every episode is him dealing with one of his clients, you know, or going to pick somebody up. He's just one of those actors that you don't see every day. In the same way with Pam Greer, who wasn't a familiar face when this movie came out, he kind of had been only doing really B-movies. He had done some television stuff, but since the 70s, after Jackie Brown came out, he did have this almost like a like a second career, like he was starting to get cast in all these studio films for this movie, being nominated for Best Supporting Actor, which I think really well-deserved. I, I also think Pam Greer should have been nominated, even though she wasn't. I'm always wanting to watch his movements and how he is surveying a scene, because a lot of this movie is him reacting, it's him listening, and it's him trying to figure out what he wants to do. We're like the Robert Forrester. The audience is like Robert Forrester. We're sort of like trying to figure out how all this is going to come together and if it's actually going to work. I couldn't agree more with you. Him being in this film just feels so right. And learning that Elmore Leonard had suggested him to Quentin Tarantino like a year before he cast. And then Tarantino, of course, knowing who Robert Forrester is from his extensive movie knowledge started thinking, yeah, this guy would be great. And then happening to run into him at a restaurant, they talk a little bit and Tarantino offers him the role right there. And in doing research for this episode, listening to Robert Forrester do press interviews, he seems so graceful and kind, just as sweet as can be, kind of like Max Cherry, that he was able to get this role and that it did, like you said, Justin, give him kind of a second career. And another actor who had a chance encounter with Quentin Tarantino, which led to her being cast in this film, was Bridget Fonda. They had been friends for a while, but they ran into each other on an airplane and got to talking just like with Robert Forrester, and Tarantino offered her the role right there. With a character like Melanie, she could easily be one-dimensional, just be like a, a 70s black exploitation type background girl character that's barely wearing any clothes and just there as a pretty face. But Bridget Fonda, what she brings to this role, not only just the stoner on the couch, not there for just comic relief, but what she does is enhance the characters that she interacts with. She brings out parts of them that aren't there that we see immediately, but she has a special way of pushing everybody's buttons and being irritating in order to get what she wants, or maybe there's just a little bit of brattiness to her. But her depth of character brings out other characters' traits that are helpful in understanding the whole picture. I think Bridget Fonda's Melanie is the audience's eye into Ordell's world. You know, she's the only one that really questions Ordell. And there's such great dynamics between her, Samuel Jackson, and Robert De Niro, especially the scene, this short sequence where She's hanging out with Robert De Niro alone, and they hang out for a little bit, have sex, and then hang out again. It's probably one of the 
funnier uses of a sex scene in the movie. When I think of 90s movies, I always think of Bridget Fonda. She was always one of my favorite actors of the 90s. A nice mix of like ensemble piece movies like singles to starring roles like Point of No Return. And even though the role of Melanie seems really small, especially for Bridget Fonda and how big she was in the 90s, Tarantino really needed somebody that was going to be able to hold their own with the likes of Samuel Jackson and Robert De Niro in the same scene for sure. Yeah, that's the truth. And another small role, but with a big name actor attached, was the role of Nicolette, played by Michael Keaton. And it cracked me up to learn that he went through this whole back and forth thing with Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino wanted him for the role. He was too young for Max Cherry. But Nicolette, even though it was a minor supporting role, was perfect for Keaton. And it was almost like he tried to convince Tarantino that he wasn't right for the role and went back and forth about it, but eventually settled into it, rethought it, did an audition. Tarantino thought he nailed it. Keaton's still trying to convince himself, no, man, I, I, I'm i not right for this. I'm not right for it. But really had to sit on it for the longest time. I, I don't, maybe that's Michael Keaton's process. Maybe he's neurotic. That would not be surprising to me. I definitely think Michael Keaton's neurotic. <laughs> Um, but the, the back and forth aspect, it just cracked me up to learn that. But him as Nicolette, again, with so many roles in this movie, I don't even want to imagine someone else playing that. His performance in this reminds me of that 80s era Michael Keaton, only maybe a little bit more mature, but that wiry, yeah. um, kind of character who, again, like, are talking about Michael Keaton being neurotic, that <laughs> neuroses where he's like teetering on the edge of like excitement and like, controlled chaos you know and he really you can it's hard to tell if he's like trying to play Jackie or if he's like really in enthralled with her and but I love when Michael Keaton does a thing where he's excitable he's like oh yeah she's gonna work with us you know with Michael Keaton being a little neurotic I think that he in the 80s especially tended to be kind of more towards the extreme part of being neurotic but the controlled aspect for Nicolette is necessary in order to be an ATF guy so he doesn't seem like a caricature, but has this little bit of an edge that we can't really pin him down. And Keaton's playing this good cop, bad cop role with his partner, portrayed by Michael Bowen. And I know earlier I said that Ordell's character was the villain in this movie, but the real villain of this movie is Michael Bowen's character, (laughs) and he does such a good job of it. I mean, he's only on screen for a little bit of time, but him sort of really talking down to Jackie and saying, you know, the whole scene where he's like, you know, the shitty little airline and you really didn't light the world on fire. It's really, you just want to punch him right in his face. And you you really, that at that point, you're like, oh man, please give us more Michael Keaton because I don't want this guy (laughs) talking to to Jackie anymore. I don't like the way he's talking to her. You want to come to her defense so badly. He plays another really scummy character in uh, Kill Bill, the the Buck character who is... uh, you know, has the uh, horribly named vehicle. Yeah, that's right. Tarantino must know he can play a scumbag really well. And rounding out the cast, the character who's referenced countless times throughout the film, he's the first pivotal moment in the movie, and that is the character of Beaumont, played by Chris Tucker. And Chris Tucker, at this point in his career, had already established a name for himself. So Tarantino was more than pleased to have him in even just this little bit role. Don't get me wrong, I love Chris Tucker. I enjoy him more in small doses, and this was a absolute perfect amount of screen time to utilize all the little quirks that Chris Tucker does. And you're right, that you know, Chris Tucker, this is post Friday pre rush hour, like right at the exact moment of like I think the height of Chris Tucker fame. And he by far gets the biggest laughs in this movie. Pretty much everything he says in this is really hysterical and memorable, which I think is important for this role because, like you said, the name Beaumont comes up multiple times. It's a character that we need to remember. Going back to movies that we've talked about in the past, like The Godfather, where they have a character who doesn't really make a memorable impression on you, but then that name is referenced multiple times later on. You're like, wait, who's that character? But Beaumont, you don't forget who he is. Chris Tucker makes such an impression that that name can be reused throughout this two hour and 40 minute movie. And we're never confused. It's like, oh yeah, Beaumont, Chris Tucker. (laughs) I remember him from the beginning, the very beginning of the movie. Keep using his name if you need to. 
And before we close out the cast here, just two mentions. Um, Sid Haig, who was in multiple movies with Pam Greer in the 70s, has a small role as a judge, and they both give each other kind of a look. I thought that was kind of clever stunt casting on Tarantino's part to reunite them together. When I was watching this multiple times uh, leading up to us doing this episode, every time it got to the clerk who checks out Pam Greer, who sells her the suit in the mall before they do the money exchange. Her voice sounded so familiar to me, but I could not place it. And then, you know, later on I looked it up and it's uh, Amy Graham, Heather Graham's younger sister. And once I got that information, the final watch that I did before we recorded, I was like, oh man, totally sounds like Heather Graham. And you can totally see it too. Man, not knowing that while watching it and you just saying it now, I can just think back to that scene and be like, oh yeah, definitely related to Heather Graham. Also, I got to love that Tarantino threw in Sid Haig for this movie. It just shows that he truly loved and appreciated the genre from which Jackie Brown was born. I totally agree. And I think that's even evident in Tarantino's music choices for this movie, using 70s music and again, paying homage to that time period of filmmaking. And as much as people always say Tarantino is self-indulgent, I think he uh, really reserved himself here by not using any surf music for the Bridget Fonda character because, you know, it works so well in Pulp Fiction. Everybody loved it. And it just seemed like a no brainer, like, hey, I I'm going to pick out a a surf song out of my vinyl collection and slap it on any scene that has Bridget Fonda in it. But instead, he shied away from that. And, you know, I think really utilizes music that is solely focused on Pam Greer and the Jackie Brown character. He really does stay true to the overall feeling of this movie and doesn't just go into something that's very Tarantino-y that we expect out of him, especially at this point in his career. And along with Coffee, which is my pick of the week, but a lot of Pam Greer's early films in the 70s were fresh in my mind upon watching Jackie Brown. So it really stuck out to me, the songs from Coffee that Tarantino uses in Jackie Brown. And probably the most prominent one, which is not from Coffee, but from her 1971 movie, Big Doll House, where it's actually Pam Greer singing that song. It's the one that's playing over the scene where uh, Jackie goes to jail. And that song from Big Doll House was called Long Time Woman. And that song was something that Tarantino used when they were actually shooting. He played the song. I think it was a little bit part as a joke and part because he just thought the song was cool. Um, And Pam Greer thought it was funny, but she said she was kind of shocked to find out that he put it in the actual final cut of the picture. A little meta there. You know, we've got her singing to herself. I don't know. I like it. I love that aspect. And it just further enforces Tarantino's desire to give this movie the dignity and respect uh, that it deserves on its own as well as paying homage to the movies that he's drawing on from the 70s. Usually a band or a pop star, someone is mentioned in the early Tarantino films, like mm-hmm. a character is talking about them. And certainly here we've got the Delphonics where Pam Greer plays them. And then later on, Max goes and buys the cassette tape. This is a group that's been around for a long time, you know, had a hit, you know, was it like 60s or 70s? Yeah. And that name gets stuck in your head and then you know, you're like, oh, I want to go out and buy a Delphonics cassette tape now after hear- after watching this movie and hearing this song like five times. It certainly made me look up the Delphonics and I played them all the next day at work. If I'm being totally honest, uh, the first time I heard the song Didn't I Blow Your Mind this time was in the uh, late 80s. Um, it was a B-side on one of the uh, New Kids on the Block albums. They did a cover of Didn't I Blow Your Mind this time. Oh. And then when I saw Jackie Brown, I was like, whoa, that's like the new Kids on the Block song. Which version do you like better? Uh, You know, I'm not going to (laughs) say. And while the soundtrack is just one great song after another, the one that sticks out that bookends the movie is Bobby Womack's Across 110th Street. I can't even count. I don't want to know actually how many times I've played that on um, my Spotify. It's obscenely like way, way too much. Uh, but I love that song. I think of Pam Greer. I actually I think of her at the end of the movie more so than the beginning. The beginning shot is beautiful over that song, but by the end, when we hear that song again, Jackie Brown has 
been through the ringer and you feel that song just right there with her. And I'm a big fan of the whole bookend with music. Yeah. I, I think it's a great, yeah. Uh, when, when movies pull it off and yeah, I agree. I, I love this song though. I'll, I'll admit I have been looking forward to finishing recording this episode because it's the only way I'm going to get that song out of my head because it just <laughs> kind of plays in a loop. And I didn't realize that song was made specifically for a movie with the same name across 110th Street that came out in 1972. And I did rent the movie digitally to check it out. I don't know. It wasn't for me. There's sections of that movie where you can see Tarantino probably saw that movie and pulled from it. But he, again, has a way to pull from movies, but then make the movie that he's making so much more entertaining and interesting. And another song I really like in this movie that I think is very effective is when Ordell's waiting outside Jackie's house and he's going to potentially kill her and he's putting the gloves on. And it's Johnny Cash's cover of Tennessee Stud, which is from, uh, I think it was like four albums that Johnny Cash did before he passed away where there was just a bunch of covers. And it sounds like that was like they put like some sort of live audience in the beginning, of, in the intro of the song. And it's a strange choice to play because at first, I think you, you said this off the mic, the first time you heard it, you were like, is this supposed to be him listening to it in his car? Or is this yeah. just over? Because it? It sound, the song sounds like it's recorded in like a small club or something. But it is unsettling and it makes me focus in on the lyrics of the song. And since listened to that song many times in the last couple of weeks and uh, really, really great song. And the original is actually really cool too. I've tracked that down. Everything that Tarantino does with inserting pre-existing songs, so intentional and sometimes meant for you to focus on the song, sometimes to distract you from what's happening in the movie. But really, he's just wanting to create this overall picture and does it so seamlessly well. Now, when Jackie Brown was released, it would just be impossible for it to repeat the success of Pulp Fiction, even though everybody wanted to see the new movie that Tarantino had made. It was kind of strange that they released it during Christmas. Um, this doesn't feel like a Christmas type movie. No. It also went up against Titanic that Christmas season, which would be impossible for any movie to compete with Titanic. Oh, um, but Jackie Brown did open a number two at the box office to a small amount. It went on to make seventy million worldwide. Its budget was only twelve million, so that's still a pretty good take. But compared to Pulp Fiction, which just made astronomical numbers comparative to its budget and its worldwide box office gain. But Jackie Brown was a hit with critics. A lot of audiences had the same view as I did when I watched it, which was we were looking for Pulp Fiction too. And then we got this very slowly paced crime movie that didn't have a lot of crime in it, which really (laughs) in a way is what Reservoir Dogs is. You know, it's just a very talky movie. So is Pulp Fiction. But there was something different about this. It would be a while before Tarantino would do another movie. I mean, he you know, I think uh, in between Jackie Brown and Kill Bill was like the longest, you know, one of the longest spells he had spent before releasing another movie. And I think Jackie Brown was the the cap on this era of Tarantino after Jackie Brown. Um, he only used Robert Richardson as his cinematographer. His movies were much, much bigger in scope and the budgets were much bigger. Uh, the style was a lot more splashier and his movies just weren't as subdued as they were during this first three crime movie period of the nineties. I think it's kind of cool really though, because I I like directors who kind of change and adapt, you know, there's certain directors I think that just kind of keep doing the same thing, Mm -hmm. you know, no matter what decade they're in and just like, like Woody Allen, you know, he just kind of keeps on making the same, you know, switches actors around, but same theme, same stories, Um, But Tarantino really, each decade that went on, you know, he challenged himself more and tried to make bigger and and more interesting movies. But um, I love the small scale of Jackie Brown. It's still the one of the Tarantino movies that I go back to more often. And it's just a really great ride. I was starting to think that Jackie Brown should be a movie that if you uh, if you really love it and since it is such a misunderstood movie and maybe movies of your life, I'm, I'm talking about myself And if you're thinking about dating anyone, that maybe this should be like the test, like show them Jackie Brown, see how that goes over. Can they hang with it? Do they see how brilliant it is? I don't know. This is I I haven't had the opportunity to test this out yet, but it's, it's a working theory. I swear in an interview one time, Tarantino said, you know, if someone said Jackie Brown was their 
favorite film of his, he would say, you're not a fan of my movies. Because <laughs> he, you know, <laughs> kind of thinks this is yeah. the, one of his more different or one of his most non-Tarantino yeah. movies. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think you know, so I too. think that this one is his most reserved and mature movie as far as like not doing what Tarantino does. But I don't mind when Tarantino goes all the way and goes totally ape shit. I think that he's right when he says that. And while I do think that he is one of the most brilliant directors of our time, I'm not someone that's like a rabid, rabid Tarantino fan. I can recognize how awesome he is and prolific. And I love his writing probably even more than his directing. But I kind of do agree that if you do like Jackie Brown, that you're not like a a rabid Tarantino fan. And I mean, that's me. But I can easily recognize his brilliance. And while critics recognize Jackie Brown as a really big achievement and show of growth in Tarantino's career, the main actors got some acknowledgement as far as being nominated for some awards. No one won any of the awards they were nominated for, but it really should be noted that both Pam Greer and Samuel L. Jackson were nominated for Golden Globes and both for Screen Actors Guild Awards. Robert Forrester was the only one that got an Oscar nomination. And even being nominated always does something for one's career. So even though I feel like this movie should have been maybe recognized a little bit more, at least it got some recognition for the lead actors. Yeah, retrospectively, looking at it, it should have been nominated for like at least six Oscars for this movie. And being nominated to in a musical or comedy category, I don't get that. I mean, I know that it's not exactly a drama, but it's more of a drama than it is a comedy. Yeah. It was pitched as a comedy. I think they were really trying to sell it hard to the public as this, even if when you look at the old like teaser trailers and stuff, they're just, they make it look like it's like a slapdash type comedy. I don't get it. I mean, I have seen plenty of movies butchered into looking like they're, they're not what they are in trailers, but yeah, Jackie Brown, not a comedy. Well, let's stop there. We'll uh, come back for some Jackie Brown, we'll have some final thoughts on it before we close out the entire episode. But let's move on to our picks of the week. We kept these both Pam Greer oriented. I did uh, Above the Law, but Lindsay, you did Coffee. What can you tell me about that movie? For some diehards of the genre or the encyclopedia brain of Quentin Tarantino, talking about coffee is like talking about a sacred film. But I'm not a black exploitation expert. However, I do have a special relationship with this legendary Pam Greer film from 1973. I found this Jack Hill movie when I was about 17 and was naive enough to think that this movie really spoke to me. But it wouldn't be until I was older when I realized what a truly important movie this is, especially for the time period. I really just thought I'd found something no one else had ever heard of. Pam Greer plays Flower Child Coffin, who just goes by coffee, an L.A. nurse who's regularly saving lives and seeing the pain her community is in every single day. But she's got a big secret. You see, her little sister is a heroin junkie, almost died, and she now resides in a clinic attempting to get herself clean. Coffee is consumed with how wrong it is that such a young girl can turn into a drug addict. She's been sending money to her sister for school and whatnot, but it's been going to smack. In her line of work, Coffee sees one addict after another relapse and die, and she's not going to let that happen to her sister, or anyone else. She's determined to stop the cycle, which becomes evident in the first couple scenes of the movie. Even if you've never seen this movie in its entirety, you might be familiar with the end of the opening scene wherein Coffee's pretending she's about to have sex with a drug dealer, but ends up pulling one hell of a gun on him, then turning it on a junkie in the same room. It was easy for him because he didn't believe it was coming, but it's not going to be so easy for you because you better believe it's coming. I mean, that scene, oh, just gives me chills every time. Coffee's vengeance is unrelenting, but she's still human. She's plagued by the reasons which have brought her to killing a dealer, to this twisted idea of terrorizing a smack addict for corrupting others. For her, the only way to make a difference is to take matters into her own capable hands. Coffee knows no cop is going to help her. In fact, her one decent good cop connection is beaten to a pulp for standing up against a drug cartel. No one is out there to help Coffee's sister or other girls like her. On a dumb teenager level... Coffee spoke to a part of me which wasn't necessarily super anti-drug, which this movie completely is, but more the idea of seeing injustices within a small town I grew up in and thinking there was no way to knock the kneecaps out of the problem. I was just, you know, an angry baby gay living in a town where very regular racist and bigoted comments and actions were commonplace, and mostly just people looked the other way or even joined in. Now, Coffee's not out there blowing people away. She's infiltrating organizations, posing as a prostitute to gain access to the inner realms with the hopes of taking all the head guys down from the inside. 
She's got connections, but even her soon-to-be congressman boyfriend doesn't know her secret life. And Coffee doesn't know about his secret life either. It's really the boyfriend double-crossing plot which amps up the severity of the movie and shows this movie really wanted to challenge the viewer and forever makes us think of Pam Greer as a superhero. Everything that happens to Coffee gives us no other option than to root for her and cheer her on while she eliminates everyone involved in this drug ring. She knows she can't change everything overnight, but chipping away from the inside is better than the paralyzing feeling of doing nothing. Exploitation films aren't for everyone. They're violent, a lot of nudity, a lot of dialogue that wasn't acceptable then and sure as hell isn't okay now. There's numerous parts which are super cringeworthy or upsetting, but remember, Coffee is the hero, she's going to make it out of this, and the entire point of the movie is to get revenge on the bad guys. Everyone gets what they deserve. Depending on your familiarity with 70s and 80s TV and movies, you might recognize some faces, but probably the most recognizable is going to be Sid Haig, who plays one of the big drug cartel's main thugs. As we already said, he was in at least six other movies with Pam Greer, including his bit role in Jackie Brown. As we brought up before, Tarantino uses part of Coffee's soundtrack in Jackie Brown, and truly, the music in this film gives it such a pumped-up pep that it needs. I mean, there are so many instances where this happens throughout the movie, but the one that sticks out to me is the final chase scene where Coffee gets away from Sid Haig, and the music here just makes your heart quicken in the exact same way as it does with its usage in Jackie Brown. Most people know Pam Greer as Foxy Brown, which was her next film after Coffee, and somewhat of a sequel. And my heart's just always going to lie with Coffee. She's real world, powerful, strong in her convictions, smart in her motivations and actions. And it's because the struggle is still very real with the subject matter depicted in Coffee. It's also very atypical for an exploitation film of the time to be so anti-drug. Jack Hill, the director, really did care about the material in his films, especially the later ones like Coffee and Foxy Brown and Switchblade Sisters, which was not a Pam Greer movie. He was very influential and considered one of the best in the exploitation genre. You can watch this movie rooting for Coffee, but man, by the time you get to the end, you're spent, bruised, beaten, bloody, dirty, and roughed up. Coffee's final confrontation exposes her raw nerve, and Pam Greer's performance really does shine by the time we get to her final showdown. Such a serious movie. There's really no screwing around. Coffee will make you want to fight every injustice, liar, and manipulator who dares cross your path. Or at least, that's how it makes me feel. Yeah, I'm really glad I was able to catch Coffee before we record this episode. And it really is one of those low-budget movies that makes the most out of everything. It's so raw and gritty, and like I think what it lacks in budget, it makes up for in sheer determination of the coffee character and Pam Greer really um, making a name for herself in this movie. I mean, rightly so. She really takes charge in this movie and you don't want to mess with coffee. No way. I'm glad that this episode led you to being able to watch that movie. All right. I think it's time for uh, your pick of the week. You did Above the Law. That is correct. All right. Didn't think I was going to pull out a Seagal movie, but I had to eventually get one in there somewhere. I can't wait to hear it. So I know at first glance, Above the Law seems like kind of a goofy choice. And when I was looking at movies with Pam Greer in them, you know, I went back to the idea of like, when this movie came out, Pam Greer was like the biggest name in the movie. Above the Law, rewatching it, I really, really think this is a great film. And kind of going back and looking at the movie, whatever you think about Steven Seagal, it's undeniable that this guy had some charisma in that Above the Law was an It was partially based off his idea for a story. Part of it's based off his real life. He had not been in a movie period before Above the Law. He started his career as the top billed actor in this movie that had like a pretty decent budget. It was like seven, eight million dollars directed by a really sturdy action director, Andrew Davis, who he would work with Seagal again with Under Siege. I think Above the Law and Under Siege are Seagal's two best movies I think a lot of it has to do with Andrew Davis, the director, and a lot of it has to do with Seagal listening to a director versus after Under Siege, he pretty much kind of called the shots and everything he did after that, I think kind of went downhill very quickly. But I stand by Seagal's first five movies, Above the Law, Hard to Kill, Out for Justice, Marked for Death, and Under Siege. All really good movies, but if you're going to do a deep dive into Seagal, I suggest you start with Above the Law. It's uh, all takes place shot on location in Chicago. The city is a big part of this movie. Seagal plays a CIA operative who, in the beginning, we learn kind of t- tells his life story, you know, of him growing up. And he goes to Japan. He starts teaching martial arts, and that really happened in Seagal's real life. He borrowed from that a little bit. He 
gets called upon to work in the CIA. They're trying to torture somebody for information during the war, and Seagal kind of opts out of this mission. He stops the torture session going on. He's like, you know, I can't be a part of this. And he walks away from the CIA, eventually becomes a a Chicago cop. And upon uh, one of the first busts that he makes with his partner, played by Pam Greer, they find C4. Eventually, there's a lot of plot that happens in this movie, um, kind of a ridiculous amount. And it's it's not a hard movie to follow, but it, it almost has like, too much story, I think, at times. Um, but they find the C4. Eventually, um, the CIA, the guy that he you know was against in the CIA, um, he recognizes him. Um, there's like this internal uh, affairs situation happening in the Chicago Police Department, and Seagal is like stuck in the middle of it. He doesn't know who he can trust at times. It's very fast movie, and this movie clocks in at about 95 minutes before credits. I feel like it's this is how they used to make action movies, where like every minute is used. There's really great, uh, realistic looking stunts. This was a time period in action where we had uh, the late 80s, we had Seagal or Van Damme, and they were kind of. It was the action hero that was moving away from so much gun play and moving into more choreographed fight scenes. There was certainly some of that with Sylvester Stallone and Schwarzenegger, but um, Seagal and Van Damme, I think it was more about the fights versus the gunfire, though there is a reasonable amount of gunfire in Seagal movies as well. Pam Greer, though her role in this movie isn't huge, um, Andrew Davis used her again in a small part in his movie... um, the package with Gene Hackman. She's playing sort of a similar version to the coffee type characters that she played before only as a uh, tough as nails Chicago cop. And she's the cooler for Steven Seagal's character trying to keep him grounded because for a character who uh, wanted to shut down a torture session, uh, Seagal's character, um, Nico really loves choking people out. I mean, that's like his number one thing in this movie is just like, I'm going to beat somebody down and choke him out. He's kind of a bully throughout this whole movie. He's not just, uh, I can't do just one or two punches. I got to like really like pummel somebody into submission uh, several times where you're like, you know, almost like looking away from the screen. For this being his very first movie, um, he does have a thing where he he sort of mumbles a lot. So there's times where I had to back it up and like kind of re-listen to the dialogue, but he is very charismatic. He's like pretty witty in this. He has a, like a very dynamic screen presence and the fight scenes are like very, very well executed. Aside from Pam Greer, there's a couple of that guy actors in this where you've seen him in television. You've seen him in other stuff and bit parts. Um, there's also a bar scene where Seagal comes in and starts like roughing dudes up. Two extras in this bar scene are John C. Riley and Michael Rooker at the uh, very beginning of their career. So interesting seeing these faces that are like really huge now um, playing such big parts in this. Uh, another big face that is very underused in this movie and you almost feel bad. It's like you're you're so happy that uh, Total Recall came out and Sharon Stone got her due because she plays Seagal's wife in this and man, she's like really not given much in this role, but it is wild seeing her in a tiny role like opposite Seagal. And uh, I'm forever going down the path of like recommending movies for these Saturday, Sunday afternoon (laughs) jaunts. And this is like fits right in there. Uh, This is like the perfect like kickback on a Sunday afternoon. Seagal kind of just like roughing guys up and Again, very short, a lot going on in this movie. It's not uh, your run-of-the-mill plot. And again, very, very great and action-packed direction by Andrew Davis. You can kind of see that he was, his movies were starting to stack. You know, he went from this to The Package to Under Siege. And then I think his masterpiece, which is The Fugitive. Have you seen Above the Law? If I have, it's been a long time. And looking at images from it, it's familiar to me, but I couldn't, like, everything that you're telling me is like, I've never seen it before. I'd be lying if I said I didn't go on like just a Seagal kick after uh, <laughs> I watched Above the Law. I just kind of kept going all the way to Under Siege. Damn, Under Siege. I mean, they, they're they basically just ripping off Die Hard from start to finish, but uh, what an entertaining and great movie. I remember that one. Yeah. That and the, the sequels really. I mean, I at least remember liking the sequel a lot. So those are our picks of the week, Coffee and Above the Law. That's a fine double feature right there. That's a real ass kicking double yeah, feature. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's your Murray moment. Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear. And when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. 
You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even chill. Okay, this is so scrumptious. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes embrace all striking. That was fun. One of many unforgettable aspects of Jackie Brown is the cast, which had Robert De Niro in a role which was somewhat out of the norm for what people were used to. And this made me think about Mad Dog and Glory, the 1993 film De Niro and Billy did together, along with Tarantino favorite Uma Thurman. Billy plays a fairly intimidating mob boss with a love for stand-up comedy. De Niro's a timid crime scene photographer who happens to inadvertently save Bill's life. For once, De Niro gets to be the nice guy and Bill's the villain. The two seem to relish the role reversal, and it was De Niro who recommended Bill for the part. He thought he was a good actor until he had to play a nice guy, Bill said of De Niro. Then you find out how miserable it is to be nice. It's just a horrible gig. I could be horrible all day long, and it fit right into character. And audiences didn't see this pair coming, nor a fistfight between the two actors over Thurman, the love interest. And now I gotta have a fight with the raging bull, right? And I had this fight once before in a movie, and I accidentally clipped this guy's nose, and I thought he was gonna hit me with a fire extinguisher, Bill said. If I hit this guy, meaning Bob, I'm dead. Because the whole time... All these teamsters were saying to me, you know, uh, he really could have been a middleweight. You know that, right? It's not enough he's got Oscars. Because he can hit, and he can take it, too. Just look at him. It ended up being the longest fight in history. Well, kind of. Shooting began in 1991 and concluded with a reshoot the following year. There's a brief, very candid interview out there of these guys and producer Martin Scorsese talking about fighting with each other, and it's kind of cute. De Niro saying with some seriousness that Bill's really strong and a good fighter. And Bill's looking at him like, oh, wow, I really appreciate you saying that. And turns out with each take, the two actors would get up to speed by fighting for one or two minutes before the camera would even roll. And it seemed like filming the fight scene was pretty fun. Good, wholesome fun, according to De Niro. Bob was constantly getting his face made up, getting uglier and uglier, Bill said. It looked like somebody dropped a milk crate on his face from a third story. Director John McNaughton attempted to use stunt doubles, but this was quickly abandoned because De Niro and Bill just looked better and really gave it their all during these sequences. Bill's a tough Irish kid from Chicago, said McNaughton. You wouldn't want to get in a fight with Bill Murray, trust me. McNaughton went on to say that Bill accidentally broke De Niro's nose with the first punch he throws in the fight sequence. The guy's got a certain toughness about him, and De Niro's no slouch either, a tough kid from early on too, so it makes sense that a fight scene between the two would pack a real punch. It doesn't really look staged. And also helped that De Niro would do 20 push-ups between each take. But that 92 reshoot of the fight scene happened because of public perception. The original ending of the film was Bill beating the ever-loving crap out of De Niro. And test audiences just didn't believe that the Raging Bull would go down like that. It's always so mind-boggling to me that the public can play such a role in movie making like this. So much of my generation's approach to comedy was a reaction against the neediness of performers, said SNL creator Lauren Michaels. When Bill was on stage, he didn't care much about if people liked him, and because of that, he had enormous integrity. When Bill's good, it's the same as De Niro's good, and you wouldn't have said that about any comedian in the last generation. Lauren isn't the first to make the comparison between De Niro and Bill. I remember listening to an interview with Bill saying that some newer generations might think of him in more serious roles and De Niro in comedies, which is just a wild role reversal. However you think of them, Mad Dog and Glory is an interesting shakeup for both actors, because though one is a good guy and the other the villain, they both cross those boundaries for this mixed-up bad comedy. Even Scorsese has mentioned that though there's a lot of humor within these characters, there's a fine line between humor and using humor to be threatening. It's fun to tell people I did a movie with Bob where I'm the bad guy, Bill said. It really lights people up in a big way. This idea of of Bill Murray and De Niro sort of playing like opposite type roles that they normally do. I don't know 100% if it works totally in this movie, but it's totally passable and I, I enjoy this movie. Even if you don't think it works, it's really interesting to watch watch it all happen and go down. Because yeah. it's not, um, if you don't think it works, it's not the fault of either actor. It's just, um, I don't know, it's it's really a whole different animal by itself i think it's easier to watch it now because there's not the bill murray and de niro have went different paths in their acting styles and 
De Niro does more comedy now and Bill Murray does more drama. So it actually now is the time to watch it if you haven't never seen it because it won't seem so weird seeing them play opposite. That is a very good point. Well, thank you for that Murray moment. Of course. Well, before we close things out, I know we both had a mutual final thought Oh yeah. Uh, for once <laughs> and uh, a really great one. It was a great memory of us going to actually see Pam Greer live uh, before a Jackie Brown screening. And this was in the beginning of the podcast, the, the early days, and we were really figuring each other out. And this was a, a good bonding moment, getting to see yeah. Pam Greer live and in person and, and Jackie Brown on the big screen. Yeah, this was a... 2017 yeah. at the St. Louis Film Festival. They had a, a tribute to Pam Greer and she came and they gave her an award and they showed Jackie Brown. But before that, she did probably a full one hour of Q&A with the oh, audience yeah. that was really interesting and kind of talked about how she came to Hollywood and started out working on some student films and then got into the black exploitation scene. I didn't get to have my question answered, but um, you know, I next time, next time, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna make myself more known. And Pam Greer was like as cool live during oh a Q and A as you would expect her to be. Yeah, I felt really starstruck. It, it doesn't happen like uh, I mean that situation doesn't happen very often yeah. to me. But sitting there in the same room with Pam Greer, yeah, I, I felt like a little kid. It was cool seeing Jackie Brown on the big screen again, too, because mm-hmm. that, that just doesn't seem like a film that's going to really get played um, like as like a a retroactive thing anymore. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, St. Louis International Film Festival. Way to kill it. Yeah. It's good for St. Louis. We need that kind of yes. positivity. Pam Greer, thanks for coming here. Yes, thank you. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our episode on Jackie Brown. If you're a Tarantino fan, again, you're in luck. Uh, We'll be doing the 30th anniversary of Reservoir Dogs in September. I'm looking forward to that. Um, If you haven't already, please do follow us on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. uh, We're on Instagram. I think we're the most active on Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it if you can. We've got all of our episodes on there that you can listen to. And they're also archived on our website at don'tpushpausepodcast.com. Um, there you can also contact us if you like, or you can always email us at don'tpushpausepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, next up, we're going to be doing one of my favorite sequels of all time, and that's Lethal Weapon 2. You might ask, why aren't you guys doing Lethal Weapon? Why are you doing Lethal Weapon 2? You'll get the answer to that question at the next episode. Sure will. Until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reaper. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, guys.